my absolute pleasure to introduce our special uh, keynote speaker today, Kathy Eric. Uh, Kathy's actually, um, I was looking back over the history and um, she's been speaking every year uh, at our events since 2007, so um, we're incredibly grateful for her making time in her busy schedule to do that. Uh, I actually missed last year, so the first, uh, the only one I've missed in 13 years, so for my things now I get to do the introduction. Um, so uh, I think you all know Kathy, but um, just a few uh, highlights. Um, she's an OSIMM Fellow, a Chartered Professional. Uh, she joined Western Mining Corporation at Olympic Dam in 1992, and almost 30 years, she's still hard at it. Uh, she's leading the team to develop geometrical models, metallurgical performance indicators for the entire deposit. She's been problem solving, studying and unravelling the complex mineralogy and geology of OD for better understanding and improved metal recoveries. Cathy's not one to seek accolades of any kind, uh, but she has been a recipient of the OSIMM Professional Excellence Award and was awarded an honorary doctorate from Flinders University in 2017. In 2018, she was awarded the Bruce Webb Medal from the GSA, and just this year has been announced as the Silver Medalist for 2020 for the Society of Economic Geologists for her outstanding contributions to the advancement of economic geology. So for those of you who haven't had the pleasure of attending one of Cathy's uh, talks, you're in for a real treat. Uh, and for those of you who've been in the past, you know that you always come away learning something new uh, whenever Cathy presents. Um, it's an amazing all body and the important work that Cathy and her team are undertaking can't be understated. So I will now hand over to Cathy. Thank you, Janine, and thank you to everybody who attended. I'm always, at least every year, I'm amazed at the people that continue to return. And that puts a little bit of onus on me to make sure that I tell you something different, because it's very easy to recycle what we talk about. At, at Olympic Dam, we haven't talked a lot or presented publicly a lot about radionuclides in our concentrates. And radionuclides in our constant, copper concentrates is the reasons that we have uh, smelting and refining at, at, at the Olympic Dam. And that's the reason we don't ship concentrates around the world for smelting uh, in the global smelter pool. So well, just to launch it off a little bit, my name is up there on, on its own, but it's a whole team of people that support me in the background. And so that's always to be acknowledged, and some of them are in here today. These little pictures you're going to see some of them were presented at the Uranium Conference, but most of them aren't. The full context is going to be a little bit different over the last couple of years. And now we understand some of the reasons why we can't get our uh, radionuclides and our concentrates down low enough. So these things you'll see some. Sorry about the colors in the back, background, guys. Uh, and lights, wherever we can trim any lights around here would be good. Thank you. So, long time ago, I used to think I could do everything on my own. And I liked living in that planet for a long time, and it turns out you can do things on your own, but you're not going to do it very quickly, and it takes a long time to do that, and you may not develop the best product on your own. The story about radio midwives involves a lot of people, and we have to recognize that over 300 geoscientists, metallurgists, radiation physicists that worked at the Olympic Dam before it became a, um, an asset and up until now, so there's a big a lot, of, a lot of people that have contributed along the way. All the other stuff in, big, in, in the bigger print there is, we've done a lot of work with the universities over the last, you know, intensively over the last five years, and less than in the past, but still a fair amount. And this just lists some of the contributions, and since we're in South Australia, we have to acknowledge the, uh, the, the South Australian government, and, and the former, I'm not sure if they called it more, uh, the Department of State Development of the Geological Survey, because they've been partnered with us on a lot of this work. So, the current state. And excuse for the reading a, a little tiny bit, but our flotation concentrates, these are just some facts, contain about 1,500 to 3,000 ppm uranium and the associated natural decay products. And they're all in secular equilibrium. And we'll talk about what some of those words mean later on. After we do a concentrate leach, we still have greater than 100 ppm uranium and 
its associated radio nuclides. And remember that 100 ppm, we'll talk more about that. But after you do a concentrate leach, we're no longer in secular equilibrium, which means we've disturbed the, uh, disturbed the decay chain. And we're going to talk why that's important. So OD copper sulfide concentrates, both pre and post leach, are classified as radioactive. However, we have done an extensive uh, amount of negligible test work over the decades to produce copper sulfide concentrates, which could be processed off-site. No matter what we've done, we can, we can lower those levels of radionuclides, but we can't get them low enough in order to um, treat them, easily treat them elsewhere. So we're not talking about marketability, but we just can't get them low enough so that they're considered as non-radioactive. So you say, why? You know, why haven't we been able to achieve this? Well, we'll just skip to the answer real quickly and then we'll talk about the journey along the way. The simple answer is the uranium minerals don't host all the decay products. And it took us a long time to actually understand that. And believe it or not, it's not easy to fully understand that, but you would think, ah, um, uh, uranium decays, it has all this decay chain products, it hangs out with uranium all throughout the history of the deposit, that's fundamentally not true. So we know that there's a, a decoupling of uranium from its radium nuclides from the nano scale up to the macro scale, and then, then we take that material and we put it into a process plant and sulfuric acid leach, whether we're in tosylic or concentrate leach, actually further enhances that disequilibrium. And we'll talk about more why that's important. Okay, we haven't solved the problem, but at least now we know why. And those who've heard me talk before, it's all about minerals. Minerals, minerals, minerals. Minerals, minerals, minerals. Never get over minerals. Okay, worry about Dave Thomas. Minerals, minerals, minerals. <laughs> now, today's presentation, first I'm going to talk to you, just show, talk a little bit about, about uranium and the uranium decay series, and a few definitions like norm and T norm and parts per quadrillion. So, parts per quadrillion are the concentrations of radionuclides that are in our concentrates. It's not easy to measure. It is incredibly low, yet it's those very, very low concentrations that we actually have to characterize. The second part we'll talk about is uh, uranium and its decay products, where they occur. Then how does uranium get actually get into our copper concentrates? Because you smart metallurgists say, ah, you shouldn't be covering uranium with copper. And that's partially true. And, and concentrate for leach, leach uh, removes most uranium, but not much of the radionuclides. Sorry, that's a little bit bright in the background. This is a 30 micron size particle. It's a, a particle that contains calcopyrite, or sorry, calcite, boronite, and hematite. And the brighter white things, and all the images we see brighter white, are just uranium bearing particles. So nice to see a beautiful composite particle. That's in concentrate. That's in our con. They all don't look like that, but they're there. This is a particle about the same size. It is calcite and covalite and it has some bright spots in it. You see a lot of holes in it. And this is a, a particle that has gone through concentrate leach. So all those holes are actually uranium dissolving. And if it was very, very dark in here, we would be able to see little tiny specks of light all over that, all over that surface. And those little bit specks of light are uranium, are uranium-bearing particles. There's galena there too, but uranium-bearing particles. So smart metal just to say, Ah, all we have to do, you think about how super fine grain we would have to do to liberate those uranium particles. So even after concentrated leach, we still have them there. Now, one quote that I take from Peter Monroe and Bill Johnson, which have a beautiful, almost encyclopedia of quotes. And I'd like to share this with my metallurgical engineering colleagues over there in the corner. Along the wall, metal has no value until, until it's an sellable product. So us on the mine, geology would get excited sometimes about low concentrations. Mining engineers get all excited, but it doesn't matter actually until it's out the gate or we've made a product that we can actually competitively market. And finally, another simple question that's been around forever, and even when Roy, when they initially started up Olympic Dam, was why don't we mine copper separate from uranium? Which is pretty easy. So Dave's over here chuckling. Let's start it out over there. Um, decay chains, decay chains very quickly. Uh, uranium 238, we're going to talk about that. Uranium 235, and then the thorium decay chain, very, very low concentrations of thorium in the deposit. Uranium 235 is actually what we get paid for when we sell our concentrate, sorry, when we sell uranium product. 
Uh, uranium-233 has an abundance, natural abundance of 99.3, relative abundance, and uranium-235 is 0.7, and that's actually what the reactors pay for, for the enrichment facilities. But we're going to worry about this because this is where the bulk of the uranium is. Uranium starts at the top. Uranium has a half-life of about 4.5 billion years, and it goes down this decay chain. And it ultimately ends up with lead-206. Lead-207 is another one. Lead-208, stable, non-radioactive. But things that we're going to worry about and what are the radionuclides that are a little bit longer lived than some of the very, very short ones are things like thorium-230, but again, relatively low concentrations. Uh, radium-226, radon, we think it's a gas. Chlorium-210, lead-210 are the ones that are actually our biggest concerns. So, when I just mentioned parts per quadrillion, parts per quadrillion is not a lot. And for our analytical chemical friends out there, yes, we can analyze stuff at parts per quadrillion by using classic chemistry, but it's not easy. It's definitely not easy, but what makes it easy to do is every time one of these atoms actually decay, it gives off a little bit of energy. And simple cephalometers can pick it off. So when we're around something and it's going tick, 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 that's kind of like what uranium does. It decays real slowly, gives off one atom, gives off energy. You can detect that. I can't detect one atom doing one chemical method. So you think about that sensitivity of these devices. But, um, I, mean, I just lost my brain thought here. So, sorry. So we can easily make sure that we know about them just by, by the energy that they give off when they naturally decay. So we're going to, I'm going to refer to RNs and RN210, actually this is short for lead 210 and chlorine 210. Those have very, very short half-lives and things that have short half-lives means it wants to get all, all of its energy at once. So I sit next to some chlorine or lead 210 and your simple number just be going, you know, be screaming off the scale because it wants to give off this energy quickly. That's why it has a short half-life. The concentrations. The concentrations are not a lot. Even though the energy is a lot, the concentration isn't. All kinds of information, and information my brain does not think in units of measure that we do activity at, like Becquerel's per gram. I'm a geologist and chemical background, so I think in parts per millions or weight percent. So we're going to talk about what these actually, what these things are when it says one Becquerel per gram. One Becquerel per gram. And we're going to look at, sorry, on this column, which has uranium-238, its decay products, and the concentrations in ppm. And what you're going to see most of the time, for we start with a product that has 80 ppm, one becquerel per gram, and it goes down through this decay chain. And most of the time, you see things that are minus 10, minus 10, minus 13, minus 15 parts per million. So think about that. Start to begin the realm of parts per quadrillion. And we just worry about these little thing down here lead 210 and chlorine 210. So what does that actually mean? For, for when we start off with 80 ppm uranium, by the time it gets down through its natural decay chain, it makes only 0 0.3 parts per trillion, parts per trillion of, uh, of, of lead 210 and only um, six parts per quadrillion of chlorine 210. And these are the things that we actually have to worry about. Anything above that level is actually considered radioactive which we're just talking a few atoms around. Interesting. Very difficult to measure via chemical methods when the concentration is really less than the PPV. And historically, it's been impossible to measure these kind of concentrations at the scale of a mineral. And when we're processing our material, or like any processing area, you need to, you're, you're processing minerals, and you need to understand what the distribution of those elements are across the minerals so that you can actually go after them. So norm, norm means just that that's natural decay chain, and we'll you talk about those in the, so that natural decay chain where it hasn't been disturbed. And when we take, there's another thing called T norm, and it's a technically enhanced natural occurring radioactive material, and that just means something that's been enhanced where that decay chain's been broken. So when we take a rock and we grind it up and we float it. Everything's still natural, it still obeys that decay chain. As soon as we start chemically modifying it or thermally modifying that sample, the decay chain is completely separate and, and there's all kinds of other regulations that come into effect when you have to deal with those. Now, mineralogy. Uh, the, the, the mineralogy at Olympic Dam 
and the uranium minerals, the Olympic Dam should be giving us a lot of clues about what's going on. So we're just going to take a little look, and I should note, note Norm's over here. Norm Truman was the first person back in the early 80s that actually dated uh, Olympic Dam uranium minerals. And the number is still good, you know? So over here, a backscattered electron image. Again, we're going to look at the right spots, and this has a scale of 50 mi 500 microns, and that's a one millimeter one. Very typical kind of ores. These big chunks like that are, are sulfides. These little bit grayer ones are hematite, and these little tiny bright spots are uranium minerals around. And over here, just the scale bar is a little bit different, but the same impact, same kind of texture. It's a red jet, and a few bright spots around, and that's uranium. And those bright spots are only about 20 microns in size. So we zoom into these things, and in a modern sense, we're actually able to see and image these things like 20 microns in size, beautiful little cubic grains, and we have all kinds of like that. And these are really important ones. Then you say, well, ooh, that's nice. But then I look at the same, similar kind of rock that I see, oh, that was a nice uraninite particle here. But what's happened to it? That thing's been disturbed since it's actually formed. Fortunately, with modern technology, we can go through and date these things quite precisely. And, and these are the ones that come out at 1590. Every time that this uranium's been moved around, it actually get younger and younger dates. So we're going to jump ahead about a billion years. And in a, a sample that has a very similar kind of uh, scale across it is that this done this, we see a lot of bright whites. And those are actually high grade uranium, and it's in the, in the hematite sulfide matrix. But when we look down at the little particles that makes up that, they're not an individual crystal, they're these, often these little tiny balls of stuff. And you see the 15 micron scale bar, they're little. And these things just move around over and over and over again. Again, a little bit of geology and understand what it's doing in the ore body gives us some hint of actually what's happening back in the, um, back in the process. Even though we can see these things now and easily image them, it took us a long time to fully comprehend and then actually understand the implications of, of what we're seeing geologically, actually how it's impacting in the, in the processing. Uh, sorry, let me just back a step for a moment. Yeah, okay, sorry. Uh, there we go. So I showed you that uranium that occurs as nice little tiny crystals, and then we had this more massive uranium. We can go through, and there's, there's all kinds of ways we can tag them. First of all, the best thing to do is date them in situ, and we can do that easily. And these dates for these nice little euhedral ones that are isolated, they're about 1590 plus minus a little bit of error bar. That's the age of Olympic Dam. That was the initial formation of Olympic Dam. Then all these really weird ones, we actually get ages, like when Orm ran across 1400, we get ages at 1100, we get ages at 800 million. We get ages at, at about 650 million. We get ages at 500 million. We keep on getting ages after ages. And those are actually ages are telling us this uranium has been remobilized continually throughout the history of the deposit. These little tiny spherical ones, or, or these more massive uranium that we end up having, actually has a, these are some examples of some of the ages. So that's about Dalmarian time, 550 million years. But the more important thing is, is, is the rare earth patterns that these things contain. And these rare earth patterns are distinctive of the chemistry and the phys physical chemical conditions of which these uraniums precipitated. Uh, the, the nice euhedral early uraninites actually have a pattern that's very distinctive of uraninites that form from a high temperature hydrothermal solution. Beautiful. Then we look at these things that are a lot younger, complete, completely different rare earth pattern to them. And for those that look like throughout uraninites, uraninites around the world and classify them, we know that those have a signature that's more similar to an, a, uh, an unconformity related uranium deposit. What that really means is a lot lower temperature. And we see those at Olympic Dam. We see them at Olympic Dam, and there's a billion years difference in between here. And nature's been playing around Olympic Dam for the last bill, for a billion years. So we'll hop on. So, billion years in the making, at least a billion years in the making for Olympic Dam. We start off with these, these, these little primary uranium grains. Uh, sorry, uraninite crystals, they get modified and they get modified a lot, 1.6 billion years. This, this is a process that goes on for a billion and the end of stuff that looks like that. Okay. So the questions you start, start thinking, you can take the geological hat, put metallurgical hat back on, is what, what is the fate of the radionuclides when the uranium minerals dissolve? Because we see them dissolving in the, in the deposit. Do, do they actually decouple from the uranium? when the uranium mineral dissolves and it's radionuclides that is built up in that, what happens to those radionuclides? 
Do they precipitate immediately? Do they migrate a short distance and re-precipitate again? Uh, absolutely. Uh, do they migra mi uh, migrate on a bigger scale? Most certainly across the deposit scale. Then we also say, you know, are some of them actually transport along with uranium? Some are, some aren't. And so all those radionuclides, the things that we worry about is radium, really think about radium, uh, radon, but radon's a gas, so not so much. Lead, two, tin, and polonium, but radium, lead, and polonium all have different chemistries from uranium. So when uranium dissolves, a uranium mineral dissolves, those radionuclides, you wouldn't expect them to go along with it. And it turns out that they don't. It took us a long time to understand that. Do other minerals carry their radionuclides, which become decoupled from uranium over the 1.6 billion years of that deposit? Which minerals are uh, likely to, which minerals are the radionuclides likely to precipitate on after we dissolve the uranium mineral? What are the relative solubilities of those uranium minerals inside our the radionuclides once we're doing the sulfuric acid leach inside the plant? And what can we learn uh, about the radionuclides during processing? It's a lot to think about. So, we'll jump very quickly to a, an incredibly simplified flowchart for Olympic Dam. Ore comes in, grind in flotation to make a sulfide concentrate. Sulfide concentrate, it does have uranium in it. We have a concentrate leach. And that concentrate leach extracts 90% uh, of that uranium out. And that concentrate goes in the smelter. The concentrate Sorry, we'll back step for on the float. In the float tailings, that's where the bulk of the uranium goes. It ends up in, in uh, tails leach, where we do a sulfuric acid leach, extract the uranium out of there. But the uranium that goes into solution up in cons leach also goes into tailings leach, CCD, solvent extraction, make uranium, and out we go. This is, we're interested in the fate of what's going on with uranium and the radionuclides up there. Now, radionuclide balance, radionuclide balances all throughout the different history of the Olympic Dam, but this one was the one that was published with our EIS in 2009, and the, uh, we did the survey, but uh, all the analysis and stuff were done with ANSTO, and they provided the balance back to us. First of all, we're gonna look at uranium, a typical kind of feed grade, it varies a bit, 600 ppm, and, and the 600 ppm, then we're gonna look at it's natural, this decay chain that goes along with it, so U235, and these are Becquerel's per gram then, like seven, seven for uh, uranium, for thorium, for radon, roughly for lead and polonium. So all of those radionuclides have about the same Becquerel per gram, so that means it's in, in secular equilibrium. We take and we float that material and we make a float tail. The numbers change a little bit because some of the uranium gets recovered to concentrate, but very roughly, these numbers are about the same, you know, they're roughly the same, so flotation tailings does not change, um, does not do anything to that radionuclide distribution. Then we go into tails leach, and first thing in tails leach, we're dissolving the uranium, we dissolve some of the thorium, and we talk, take out a little tiny bit of those radionuclides, not a lot. We won't worry about CCDs. Then we're going to pop over here to concentrate leach for a minute. 2,000 ppm is the example here. These numbers here, the Beckles per gram for each of those radionuclides are approximately equal. So everything's fine, still in secular equilibrium. We take and we do a concentrate leach on that, sulfuric acid leach, and the things that are left over, the numbers aren't the same anymore. So that means it's no longer in secular equilibrium. And there's different regulations that apply to that. But the big thing we see is we had something that started off with roughly 30 Beckles per gram, dropped it down pretty low. Uh, the the radi radium lead 210 and PO210, in particular the lead 210 and PO210, ha these haven't changed, but PO210 we've enhanced it a little bit, and that's because we do a dust bleed from our smelter. But the important thing is, is they're not being touched or apparently being touched at the sample scale by concentrated leach. So we're dissolving out the uranium, we're getting rid of the thorium, but the things that are annoying are these lead 210 and PO210, they hang around. So, why? You know, why aren't we dissolving? We're dissolving the mineral that was the original host of these, but they're still hanging around Why? So, what does it fall back on? What does the mineralogy show us? And as a geologist that understands how to use mineralogy, part of my role is to make sure that I can tell the metallurgist where the elements of interest are occurring, and then it's up to them to figure out how to get it out. And for us to advance off these radionuclides and get them down even lower, we actually under need to understand the mineralogy at the nanoscale, actually. So we're saying mineralogy. 
mineralogy, I kind of mentioned that these, these things are incredibly low concentration. It was the beyond the limits of our technology until about five years ago. So, we jump, jump forward. Uh, the world's first, and we're always happy with world's first. We never go out and tell everybody we've done it for the first time, but you guys will know it now. Uh, right here in Australia, and done with Olympic Dam samples. And, and it was, we used nano sims in order to map the radionuclide distribution at the mineral scale. Absolutely game changing um, technology that allowed us to do that. No question about it. What is a nano sims? It's a high tech, it's a, um, but nano, that's the resolution of it. Sims secondary ion mass spectrometry, mass spectrometry. These are one of these instruments that cost about $3 million. Uh, two of them actually are in Western Australia. There's 40 of them worldwide, and there was two at the University of Western Australia. The main thing is you can measure isotopes. You can measure individual isotopes, seven at, at any one time. You have a, a resolution of 40 nanometer resolution, and that's actually absolutely powerful. And you also get, because it's a mass spectrometer, you get excellent mass separation. So I can tell the difference between 210, 212, 214, and you just go up to those masses like any of the mass specs do now. Um, the only thing it really doesn't do, it's still not fully quantifiable, but it'd be nice to know what the absolute concentration is, but the main thing is to see where they're hanging out. So we'll hop, jump forward. Technology changed. We weren't really up on it. Um, more About five years ago, there was a project that initiated actually starting with the South Australian government and then, and then with us, the University of Adelaide, uh, Flinders University, Monash and University of Queensland, and also co-supported by the Australian Research Council to actually try to address radionuclides inside of copper concentrates in South Australia. But the important thing about this whole story, it was Mark Rolog, and we'll give the credit where the person actually thought about it. Mark Rolog was a PhD student at the time, he's now completed, and he was within this project. He identified the possibility of using the nanosims to map the distribution of radio nuclides at, the, at that mineral scale. It had never been used for that purpose before. Now, we recognize that people in the Department of Defense in the US and elsewhere might have done this, but that, that information has never been published. And the people at UWA has certainly never measured radionuclides before, but it was somebody like Mark, the student, that actually said, hey, there's a possibility that we can do this. Um, the images we're going to look at, the, at the color maps in here are were produced from Mark. And once the method was established, um, other members of that whole big group of people actually started using the nanosense for, ever, all the, for their work. And all of this information is published, so we're not keeping anything secret because it's important that people know actually how, how it's done. So, we can jump back again. Now, historically, we could only have opinions about where the radionuclides were sitting on the minerals we actually never knew because we could never measure them in the them. So, we, first of all, we think if we go through, first of all, say the uranium minerals. Where does uranium hang out? Uh, the mineral host for uranium and the radionuclides, prior to concentrate leach or tailings leach, it's in the things we think about. Uranonite, cofanite, and the four mate, the three major uranium minerals. The fourth most abundant uranium mineral in the down is hematite. Then there's little bits in sulfites, there's little bits in rare earths and sericite. And these are just a couple image, this, this one image here, again that, that's probably only about 30 microns in scale. This is cofanite and bramorite that's overlying root tail. This thing is more, this is more interesting. That's only five micron scale there. And this is a hematite and, and where we've significantly enhanced the brightness and contrast. These things in here are, are little tiny arachnidite particles that you can see, sub-micron in size. Those are the tip of the iceberg of what lays behind that. So they're hematite for us. There's a lot of uranium in hematite. But that's old technology. Now, uh, again, technically not possible up until about really about five years ago to actually see where the radionuclides that have these parts per quadrillion concentrations, where do they actually sit in the minerals? So where do they actually sit in the minerals that, that host it? A good coffinite, uranonite, granite contain them, hematite, but now we're going to get all kinds of other things. Barite actually has radionuclides. Why would barite have them? Sulfide minerals along the grain boundaries. Uh, any kind of sulfate mineral in the deposit that we have, we have crandomite. Uh, minerals that actually have very high surface areas, things like molybdenite, precipitates them back out, and fluorite. So here what we're going to do, just keep mindful of time, um, 
We're going to look at a uraninite particle, sorry, a particle of boronite, and this is uraninite. This is uh, uranium-235, radium-226, and, and lead-210. So we would expect that the uranium particle that survives, that actually has that decay chain with it, and it does. So this red con this concentration is the uranium constant, uranium-235. This yellow shows where it is in it, with the radium, and it clearly overlays uranium minerals. And the, the lead does the same thing. So it's what you expect. You know, expected, but we've actually measured it for the first time. Then we go over and we say, ah, barite. Why does barite contain, um, why do we think it contains radionuclides? Very small micron size skin, 10 micron scale bar. There's barite here with all kinds of bright white minerals in those, and those happen to be little galena particles. There's some coffinite. We're going to look at the uranium 238, and you can see uranium 238, the hot spots are in the coffinites which you kind of expect. Well, if it was like, if it was uranium mineral, we'd expect the, the radium and the, the radium, the lead-210 and PO-210 to be sitting at the same place that that uranium is. It's clearly not. You know, and it's clearly not, and it's hanging out all around, all around that barite. Why? You know, we go through and say, why? This kind of scenario showed up for not only um, minerals in the ore, but then also in the concentrate and looking at all, and so we characterize all the different minerals. We, I use that term collectively, it was all the different people involved with this big hub project that we have, but we know where these hang out image after image after image after image, but it tells us the same story. It was expected for the uranium minerals, but it was completely unexpected, we were hoping, but it was unexpected for the non-traditional uranium bearing minerals. So we jumped to concentrate leach, and Again, it's no longer in secular equilibrium, but the uranium in concentrate occurs as uraninite, coffinite, granite, hematite, sulfide minerals, the same thing that it does in the ore before it gets concentrated. This is a, a sulfide particle, and there, there's some holes in it, and those were former uraninites. But again, there's all kinds of little bright white spots on it. We can see that, but I can just tell you that's where uranium is. I can't tell you where the radio nukes are. Again, Looking at concentrate leach, when we look at concentrate leach, we see the same suite of minerals for the host for the radionuclides that we saw pre-leach, but then we also start seeing other things. And the other things are things like covalite, sulfates, grain edges, pores, cracks, everything that we create during, during our uh, milling and, and acid process, actually radionuclides start attaching to that. So let's actually look at a picture. So this is a, 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 a calcopyrite boronite grain. And it's kind of ratty here. The, the bright stuff around here is actually, um, it's, it's some lead, it's galena, but there's lead sulfate, and that lead sulfate was a former uraninite that actually got dissolved away. We can look at the U238 on here, and we see that, you know, that there's little spots, hot spots in here, but there's still a little bit of uranium that's surviving after that leaching process. But again, we look at the radium, two, uh, radium and the, the lead 210 and PO210, and there, there is overlap with that uranium bearing spot, but then there's a lot of someplace else. And the someplace else is because it's been, um, it, it's occurred during concentrate leach, really. It's happened, so the remobilization that's going on. Game changing. Again, not expected. We were hoping, but not expected. So we go back. So what has mineralogy told us? Mineralogy has actually confirmed um, that, that radionuclides are separate. Sometimes if it's, it's with uranium, sometimes it's not. And it's the times when it's not is what causes us the issues. So how do we actually say, well, the first thing is just get the uranium out of the concentrate, okay? You, you can, you can, you can <coughs> grind it, ultra-fine grind it, Olympic Dam, ultra-fine grind it, and do all kinds of extra cleaning. We can get something without consolation. You can get a fair amount of uranium out, but we still can't get enough out by doing that process. So how does uraninite, metallurgist looking, Janine, I can see you being inquisitive there. Uh, how, does, how does uranium actually get into our concentrates? Um, composite particles, sulfide uranium mineral composites, uh, sulfide gang mineral uranium composites, all kinds of composites, in-train gang and uranium minerals, we should be able to clean that up a bit, in-train fully li liberated uranium minerals, because our collector, sulfide collector, should not be collecting uh, uranium. Um, and it's also entrained in hematite containing sub micron size um, and lattice substitution uranium that we saw a few, from a few of the other images. This is just an example 50 micron scale bar of a composite particle inside the concentrate. 
uh, boronite calcopyrite here. There's some granite, little tiny bits. There's a bit of coffinite, a little bit of uraninite. All these things occur on the mineral scale and occurring in a typical kind of composite inside. Of, it's a 53 micron size compo but composites, sorry, it's within the concentrate that's there. So what have we known throughout time now? That uranium recovery or upgrade to flotation cons, we don't want it going into the con, is actually a function of the uranium grade in the feed. You've got to remember that. As the uranium grade decreases, so does the uranium recovery to concentrate. Absolutely no question about that. Now, a slightly complicated graph, but it, it, it did show us a lot. Uh, from all of our GMET samples, we can go through, you know, and, and thousands of them. Uh, look at the uranium feed in the sample, and look at the ura uranium concentrate uh, in the column. Sorry, the uranium concentration in the concentrate once we do a float on that sample. And it's simple that we can look at 80% sulfides, and we can see at high grade uranium, you have high grade in the concentrate. And as that grade goes down, as that head grade goes down, so does the uranium that recovers there. What this is actually reflecting is a change in the mineralogy and associations that are of that uranium and the, how much uranium is actually hung up in uranium bearing minerals only and how much is in hematite. So what, what window do we operate at Olympic Dam in? We operate around here. Whether we're at 80% sulfide con or 90% sulfide con, we're still, we can look at that and we're still in that window. In order for us to be, make a material that's less than one becquerel per gram per radionuclide, we need to be down here and we need to be making a concentrate somewhere that's down around that box. The only way that we can make a concentrate anywhere from Olympic Dam material that's down around that box is actually mine material that actually probably has a grade somewhere around there. Okay, remember that. Most smelters in the world, the vast majority, except for a few, actually um, process concentrates that have less than 10 ppm of uranium in them. Now, so just keep that in your mind. As the grade goes down, how uranium occurs actually changes and its mineral association changes. So that impacts on how it recovers. I pulled out these a couple photomicrographs, um, 100 micron scale bars here. These photomicrographs are back from the early 80s, and I'm sure the same question was asked during uh, Norm Truman's time, Dave Thomas, Roy, and all that. Why don't we mine copper separate from uranium when we knew it was there? <coughs> this is boronite, and this is uraninite, and no matter what scale I look at, I can see they are grown. This is an example of calcopyrite, boronite, some hematite, and all that dark stuff around there is uraninite. So you say, okay, that's on at the, at the, at the grain scale. Mining engineers might say, ah, it's separate in the ore body, but we're going to look a little bit more for a minute. What do we know? That even when we look at things like the boronite or calcopyrite or, or calcocyte even in there, this is just an example of a, a concentrate roughly about 40 micron size sulfide particles here. And at the deposit scale, there is a clear association for, with copper, uh, with uranium, with the copper minerals. And we also know just by looking at some of our mineral images that there is a clear association. What this does, and the, and the scale bar, the color scale is opposite, and we're going to understand why in a minute, that red is, is hot, is, is low concentration is blue. Um, this is just the copper content. This is a slice of the ore body at about 450 meter RL, so 500 meters beneath the surface, six kilometers this way, three kilometers that way, again about 500 meters. And it's the greens and blues and yellows, the greens and blues that we really want to look at. And that's where the grade is distributed at that point. Now, we go through, why are we mining these things separate? Grade recovery curves are complicated, even I can't fully understand. But we're going to look at the, the grade curve. For the total resource, without any cut on it, this says, you know, and this is not the publicly declared numbers, these are the total resource, again, with no cuts applied to it, but there's about 17 billion tons of, of mineralized rock, and that the grade, as the ton goes down, the grade goes up, as we expect. Well, let's say we remember this 100 ppm, and we say, well, let's go through, as a magic limit, let's take out all the rock that has more, all the, the blocks in the block model that have more than 100 ppm uranium in it. That's what happens for the total resource. That's what happens. It goes from a 17 billion ton resource down to about a 5 billion ton, just by taking that out. But you say, well, we, Dave, we don't mine the total resource. We actually mine economic ore. So what next, what we're going to look at, 
is we're going to take we take that image and we've had and Dave Clark, my resource colleagues are in the audience back in here. They went through and now we've dropped out everything because we're an underground mine and we've dropped out everything that has a, um, a copper equivalent, but just thinking copper space of, of around 2.4% copper. Because that's actually what we're mining, or it's actually less than 2.4, 2.2. Depends on what we want to use. But we're amongst friends in the 2% range. And the first thing we see is boom, you know, underground, that all, all that other color that we had before, not the reds, but, but, the, but the greens and blues, actually drop down a bit and say, ooh, that's interesting. And this over here is just an enlargement in the southern line area, so just get a bit closer look at it. So for an underground, of course, we, this is our fully unconstrained op, um, resource, 17 billion tons, roughly. We, we, we go through and we're going to look at an underground resource. Boom. We apply that copper cutoff and we go down to 1 billion tons. And we say, right away, now let's go through and see what happens when we go through and say, let's take out of what's left of this, of this underground resource that we've chopped at. Let's take off everything that's less than, uh, greater than 100 ppm uranium. You don't see many colors left in there. So we're going we're to take the scale and we're going to expand that scale a bit. We're no longer, this is now up at 1.8, only billion tons, 1 billion tons for the underground resource. We take out all of the um, blocks that have greater than 100 ppm. And there's a few in here, you can't see many, but that's the purpose. You can't see many of them. We're less than, we're down to 100 million ton resource. There's a reason why we mine copper and uranium together. And Olympic Dam, until we can come up with some magic technology where we can just laser or volatize everything in situ and magically separate them, we are going to have this problem in Olympic Dam. Or it's going to be a challenge. So, in conclusion, um, it's the minerals. When we look at minerals, and even though I always made my life around minerals, I'd always like to say minerals matter. Minerals do matter. No matter what, sometimes we can get away without understanding them, but when you get in trouble, you have to call me. Uh, the chemistry of, or at least I like to fool the meddler just to believe that. Uh, the chemistry of uranium and the decay chain of each of those elements actually is different. So why wouldn't we expect the mineralogy to be different too? Lo and behold, it is. Metallurgical studies, just a, a summary. Uh, extensive metallurgical testing. We can't get it low enough, as the as the rules stand now. And again, metal has no value until it's a marketable product. Uh, the radionuclide mineralogy, the main thing, the big learning out for all this is the radionuclides do not necessarily hang out with the uranium. And there is a decoupling of uranium from the nanoscale all the way up to the macro scale. So I just want to close with one actually really cool, cool image. This is just a uh, 20 micron size, a calcopyrite grain, Backscatter electron and cobaltite, so co cobalt arsenic mineral. Cobalt and that calcopyrite, we look at a nice uniform color all the way across it. Beautiful. We make a nanosins map on here. This just is going to have a combination of, of copper, iron, and lead in it. But the first thing you start seeing is, is, is lead. It's actually built up along about this mosaic pattern. We look here with a with an optical microscope or an SEM, we can't see that. And, and then it turns out you can use what's called electron backscatter detector. I, I first said, ah, is this this some artifact? You know, something that we've created during our process. And it turns out it's actually not. It's actually all kinds of, these are, uh, this is a, a, a grain that has formed initially as one big grain. It's recrystallized sometimes af sometime after 1590. And, and these, these different colors re represent the orientation of those individual crystals. And again, with the lead along the way. And it's funny that the lead is actually occurring along these green boundaries, these sub microns, these sub microscopic green boundaries in there. This actually tells us a lot. So what do we know? The radionuclides, when they're released, they move around. They go to areas where there's least amount of energy, and those are usually cracks, green boundaries, blah, blah, blah. That's all I have to say for today. Thank you. The first thing uh, I insisted on when I took control of the Western Mine and Exploration business, which we ran very successfully for many years. And, uh, uh, the rule was that I am going to do all the hiring. And if any HR people enter the place, they are to be ignored. <laughs> <laughs> because they had no hope of understanding what we're trying to deal with when we 
are into the business of really scientific mineral exploration. Well, I got uh, uh, more, more votes of thanks from the academics around the world whom I used to visit on a regular basis to measure out, in my opinion, the quality of the students they were turning out. Um, so, uh, I left it at that. We had a good team and uh, I was still running the show from Kalgoorlie and uh, the real benefit of all the effort I put into it, of trying to understand what academics were doing and what the students were qualified to do and what they were learning. I was there and the, uh, my secretary said to them, oh, he call for you, Roy, um, Mr. Wood. Um, uh, okay, uh, overseas, I've got to listen to this. So she put the call through to me, and it was uh, uh, the professor of theology at uh, Berkeley University, George Brimble. I spent quite a bit of time there myself, and uh, uh, he was George Brimble, phoning me up from California because the best ever student to get a PhD in the long period that he was associated with the Berkeley University, one of the great universities in the world, the best PhD student that ever turned up and landed in a thesis was a girl by the name of Kathy. He said, Roy, you have to recruit this person. I said, well, that's why I got to know you. So, <laughs> I said, she's got a job, just send her over. And uh, apart from arranging travel and all the other little personal things, Kathy came, I met her in my office in Kalgoorlie, and uh, uh, she said, well, what would you like me to do? I said, I'd like you to go to an Olympic town, which uh, you've probably heard about, and uh, devote yourself entirely to the origin of the deposit and the minerality of the deposit. And I don't need to tell you what a wonderful job she's done. It's absolutely astonishing. It, abandoned, it got rid of all, first the big, big advantage was it got, got over the problem of who discovered it and why it's there. Uh, people making decisions without really understanding the minerality. What Kathy's done, quite apart from before she became so valuable to the metal nurses, was to tell us how that ore body has formed, over what period of time, what were the different changes in the chemistry of the minerals. So good geologists now have a very good basis for trying to understand how ore bodies form in the first place, where does the fluid come from? and how the organoid, how they change to make all bodies from different types and different grades. And uh, what you should be looking for if you really want a valuable, huge ore deposit. First thing, of course, is a good fluid flow, but that's another story. Kathy, you've made us, if anyone in this room is like me, you've made us feel very humble. The metallurgists had a tough job, they've always had a tough job. We tried to tell them, the geologists, what was in the ore and where it was best contained and the type of mineral it was. We tried to help them decide how to process it. How much information we just never had. Now, there's such an enormous amount of information the metal areas do have. Now I'm confident that as they get, become more familiar with what Kathy's talking about, they will discover other ways of treating the oil to get uh, a better range of products to sell. That's my prediction. Kathy, you are just a wonderful woman, um, a wonderful scientist. <coughs> George Bromhall was right when he said you're the best. He's ever seen, and uh, 
uh, it's, it's really the best I've seen in the uh, uh, hundreds of geologists that have passed through my, my hands, including uh, you, Kathy. You were number 455. <laughs> <laughs> it took me a long time to put what I really wanted and what I really needed. Thank you, Kathy.